How big and heavy were medieval pole axes, and why is that important to know? Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiator. Now I'm just back from a weekend of armoured um, training and armoured fighting um, with pole axes. I ran a pole axe class, I did my, uh, as did my good friend um, David Rawlings of the London Longsword Academy as well. And so we were looking intensively at pole axes. Now one of the things I noticed over the weekend was that a lot of people had a lot of different pole axes. Now in HEMA we tend to use um, training weapons that aren't sharp and pointy like these because we do lots of thrusting at the face and thrusting in the armpits and things like this. Obviously, uh, we can't use sharp ones, obviously, uh, but even blunt ones are a little bit too offensive. So we tend to use wooden or rubber-headed um, weapons that are usually a bit lighter than the real thing, it has to be said, but primarily it's about the safety of the points, top and bottom end uh, included, and of course um, the axe blades uh, and the beak if you have one. But in attendance at this event were lots of replica steel pole axes like this one I'm holding here, and they varied a lot. They varied in size, in length in other words, but also they varied in weight. Um, now given that a pole axe is the design that it is, and if you are going to add weight to the thing, Thing, it tends to be weight up here, um, then you end up with very different handling weapons. So for that reason, it actually changes drastically how you move the weapon and how you use the weapon. If your given weapon, whatever it is, whether it was a, um, you know, a sword, a mace, or a spear, or whatever else, if you change the overall mass and size of it, it does change to a large degree, if not totally, it does change how you use that weapon. What kind of techniques are practical to use, uh, even the guard positions that you hold that weapon in. So as I mentioned, if you make a pole axe heavier, it tends to be heavier at this end because this is the end with the langettes, with a guard if you've got one, and with the head. So the extra weight tends to be concentrated all up at the hitting end, which really changes how the weapon moves. The other thing to mention as well, is what the nature of uh, what you've got at the back of the weapon does change the weight and the um, the kind of weight balances as well. So I got to thinking, uh, look, we've got all of these different pole axes here, and actually I'm demonstrating things with, it might be a waster with a wooden weapon, or I demonstrate it with this, which is relatively uh, decently weighted uh, and balanced, and someone else over there has got a much longer pole axe or a shorter pole axe, it might be much heavier, might in some cases be much lighter. How does that actually change things? Will it actually change changes things quite a lot. So I wanted to know, what about the originals? If we go looking at original pole axes, how big are they in artwork um, and surviving ones, and indeed how much do they weigh? Now before we go and investigate that point, I want to, want to mention there are a few difficulties with answering this question. First of all, in regards to size, um, one of the issues is we could just go, well let's go and look at original surviving ones in museums. Okay, There are two major problems with that as a strategy. Number one, there aren't many surviving in museums. Okay, So pole axes are are not insanely rare to find in collections. You do find them in collections in numerous countries in the UK. Uh, if you look at all the museums in the UK, um, there's probably in the region of about 20 or 30 pole axes, uh, original 15th and sometimes 16th century pole axes in museums in Britain. Uh, and you know, you might find similar things in France or Italy or Germany, wherever you go. So they're not hugely rare, but that being said, they're not also they're also not hugely numerous. And more importantly, perhaps, it's not always possible, certainly for me at this point in time, to tell you what uh, what the size of all of those sample of that relatively small sample is, because it's not necessarily recorded. But Here's the real elephant in the room. This is why I'm not going to look at originals in collections uh, for the size part of this. I will be looking at weight, but for the size. And that is because, for the most part, the original wooden shafts do not survive. Okay, now that is entirely what dictates how long this is. Okay, obviously the head and the, the top spike has a certain length to it, but in most cases, pole axes that survive in museums, the head is original, some parts of the langettes are usually original, though not all of the langettes quite often. So the head and the top spike, very often the bottom mounting, whatever it should be, if there was one, they didn't always have a bottom spike, but often they did are very often missing, usually missing, um, and if there is something in the museum on the end of the shaft, it's usually a replacement. 
from later centuries for display purposes. So I'm not going to look at the size from uh, museums. So instead, we're going to look at the size of them as represented in art. Now, inevitably, this is also has some issues with it because art isn't always literal, especially medieval art. Uh, Renaissance art is not always literal when it comes to sizes. However, we can note some general tendencies by looking at the art when a pole axe is stood on the ground next to a person. So very generally speaking, most people in modern HEMA or living history or reenactment or anything like that tend to go for a pole axe that with the um, head, whatever style of head you've got, hammers or spikes or whatever axes, uh, with the top spike tends to come up to about the same height as the person. You'll notice standing on the ground, so I'm six foot one, I think about 184, and um, this polax is actually pretty much the same height as me. So that's about right for me, or is that right, so to speak? So there is, there, I have noticed some people, particularly uh, reenactors, um, th things will go around orally and everyone will go, I've heard, I've been told that the correct height for a polax is the same height as the person. Not that simple in medieval art as we uh, will see here. Here. So indeed, there are a lot of pole axes in medieval art which are about the same height as the person. However, from my looking through uh, medieval manuscripts and paintings, there are essentially four main groupings for pole axe height. Okay? Now, the first grouping we've just mentioned is about the same height as the person. The second grouping is uh, about a height whereby the uh, axe head is just above the person's head height. This seems to be a common sizing. So uh, when you look in medieval art, very often pole axes are actually about that long. Um, so about uh, maybe 30 centimeters longer than down there. Okay, so they tend to be above head height with the hammer and axe blade at about the height of your helmet. That's the next common grouping that we see in medieval art. Now the next common grouping we see in medieval art is Coincidentally or not, I don't know, is more similar to the height that people generally reconstruct Dane axes. If just put the pole axe down for a second. So this tends to be quite a popular size for pole axes as well, and it's often represented in medieval art by people leaning on the top. Now it's a funny thing uh, because that's quite a specific artistic thing and actually gives us a degree of confidence in the medieval art because it is because the artist has seen people leaning on the top of their pole axes like this. Now, if they're leaning on the top of their pole axes, clearly that axe head has to be about the height of the armpit. Okay, so we see this in all the way back with uh, Dane axes in the Bayer tapestry, but we equally see it in 15th and 16th century art as well. So that's the next common grouping or common sizing for pole axes is about the height that you can lean on the top of it. Okay, now the final grouping debatably is and isn't a pole axe and that is something that appears to be a a weapon that you could use from horseback, you could at a stretch use in one hand, although it's probably not very well weighted and balanced for that, but it's essentially like a pole axe that has had the shaft chopped off, and so you're left with a weapon that's about the length of a longsword. Um, and very often in art we see these held down by the side of the person and the person's holding the point, the tip of the pole axe, leaning the butt, where there's no spike of course because it's short, uh, leaning it just down on the ground here. Now those are clearly weapons that the person holds at the bottom end here, imagine there's no shaft below my hands here, and they're using it like a sort of archetypal battle axe or um, a, uh, a longsword essentially. So it's about longsword length. So there we've got the four main groupings that we can see in art. Very common to find them up to with the point up to about head height. Very common to see the axe and hammer or spike at about head height, so about 30 inches, uh, sorry, 30 centimeters taller, about a, a foot taller. Very common to see them so you can lean, which I can't with this because this one's too tall, but where you can lean on them like that. And uh, not uncommon, this is the rarest type, not that uncommon to see them much, much shorter, more kind of longsword length. So how much do these things weigh? Well, that's one of the main things I actually noticed at the event is apart from the length variation in people's pole axes, most people's pole axes were about the height of them. Okay, so there was no problem with the techniques there. Incidentally, why is that so important? Well, the length of your shaft, so to speak, makes a big difference in the t certain techniques and how they work. There are certain techniques, uh, for example, there's one where you want to slide the whole weapon back 
to your hand here and you actually put the, the top spike or the top of the axe into the person's armpit pretty much at grappling at wrestling range. It's an anti, in fact the person's trying to throw you at the time. So they're kind of in a wrestling position and you break it by slipping the weapon all the way back to here. Now clearly, if you've got a particularly long weapon that becomes unwieldy. Conversely, there are other techniques, for example, in Anonimo Bolognese, uh, where you want to be able to stab the person in the foot with your bottom spike. Well, if your pole axe is too short, you can't reach their foot. Uh, equally, in Anonimo Bolognese, there's another one where a person stabs your foot, and you parry the stab at your foot with the bottom end of your axe, and you can immediately respond with a hit to the head with your top end of your weapon. So. There are some techniques where the length of the weapon is very critical and you need a certain amount of length to be able to do certain techniques and conversely there are some techniques where if the weapon's too long it's too unwieldy to use in a closed space. So length is important but weight was the thing I really noticed. Most people's pole axes were a kind of this length but some people's pole axes were much heavier than others and some of them also having a uh, counterbalance at the back end with a spike or some kind of butt gives it a little bit better balance but equally if people have got I've noticed one of the things that makes the biggest difference to the weight of a pole axe is what kind of langettes these are the protective um, iron uh, bar well um, plates really um, strips that go along the side of here and as mentioned in previous videos, those serve, t serve two purposes. One is to protect the shaft from the enemy's weapon, and secondly, it's also to hold the shaft of your weapon together uh, when you're swinging it at someone and they suddenly parry or you hit them really hard in their armour, uh, you stop it snapping somewhere up here, basically. So it's to hold your weapon together. And if people have particularly thick langettes, and I do know a couple of uh, manufacturers that use, I would say, overly thick steel for their langettes, it makes the entire weapon much heavier than it needs to be. So how do we find out how heavy the originals are? Well, in this case, I can't tell from art, so we're gonna look at museum examples. Now, two problems here. Number one, uh, there aren't a huge number uh, to draw upon, so I'm just gonna look at a few examples from a few museums. Secondly, um, sometimes there are pole axes in museums and I don't have access to the weight data. Okay, so for example, the Royal Armouries have some pole axes on their online collection website, but they haven't listed the weight, so that's not useful to me. The other issue you might say is, well, they don't have the original shaft, so how do we know the weight? Well, all of those that I'm using do have replacement wooden shafts. So yes, indeed, they might not be exactly the same weight, they might not be exactly the same length as the originals, but bear in mind that with the pole axe, a lot of the mass comes from the head and the langettes. So, so long as we've got a head and langettes and some type of stand-in wooden shaft there, then we should at least get an approximate idea of how much these pole axes are weighing. And for reference, before we go into those museum examples, this replica here from a Casto in the Czech Republic bought via um, Armour Bohemia, this weighs two and a half kilograms, so 2,500 grams. So this first example here is from the uh, Royal Armouries. Now, first thing I have to say about it, it's a 15th century, uh, late 15th century um, pole axe, but it is missing some of its langettes. In fact, it's probably missing about 50% of its langettes. So it is going to be lower than it originally would have been in total mass. Um, but nevertheless, it's a very attractive and uh, sort of relatively typical shape uh, of head, probably... Um, probably French, um, and it is uh, 1,835 grams, 1,835 grams. So there you go. It's actually, you know, that's relatively light, isn't it? Um, but as I say, it's missing its langettes. So at a guess, I'm guessing if you add langettes onto it, um, which will be front and back and the sides, I suspect originally this would have been in the region of about uh, 2,500 grams. Uh, grams or 2.5 kilograms, the same as my replica, or possibly slightly below that. Um, so anyway, very much within the same ballpark as my replica example. This example also from the Royal Armour is now I have to say I'm a little bit dubious about this one because the constructional method on it is a bit odd. So I'm not 100% sure that this is a genuine example. That being said, 
The Royal Armoury's description doesn't say that it isn't, but conversely it doesn't give a date for it, <laughs> which doesn't uh, fill me with uh, confidence with this one. But nevertheless, um, it looks well made, even if it is a good replica, it's a good replica based on originals, and it is 2.4 kilograms. I should reiterate, I'm not saying it is a replica, I don't know, I only know from this one photograph, I haven't examined this uh, Polax in person. But it's in the Royal Armoury, so let's assume it's a genuine object, 2.4 kilograms. So again, we're in very much the same ballpark here, so 2,400 grams. Now this example in the UK's Royal Armouries is relatively famous and it is gorgeous. It is just one of the nicest surviving poleaxes, I would say. Um, very, very ornate, and uh, I love the, the beak sticking out of the hammer. It's like, hmm, should we have a hammer or a beak? Yes. Um, anyway, so this is very ornate, and as a result, it has kind of more stuff on it, particularly on the langets, although it does have piercings through the langets, which does, again, reduce the weight. So anyway, nevertheless, I would say overall, it looks like a relatively heavy example compared to some of the other ones we're looking at. And the total weight is 2.92 kilograms, so 2,920 grams. So again, very much in the same ballpark, a little bit heavier. This one's uh, close to 500 grams heavier, half a kilogram, but nevertheless, again, in the same ballpark. For anyone who's wondering about the imperial uh, measurements here, incidentally, that is six pounds seven ounces, that particular example. So to give you a, a rough, you know, we're talking about below seven pounds. Again, the Royal Armour is in the UK, in Leeds. This is a 16th century, so it's a later period um, poleaxe. This would have probably been predominantly used for tournament fighting, but then again, it could have been used on the battlefield at this date. So it's early 16th century, 1510 to 1530, it's been dated to. It has a crescent axe blade. You'll notice it has a slightly different design to some of the 15th century ones, although you do find poleaxes of this design earlier in the 15th century as well. So I think it's a good example to use. This one's very uh, interesting. It is at um, 2,155 grams. So this is lighter. This is a lighter one. So 2,155 grams. Um, and it, it's a complete weapon with a complete shaft. It's got its langets and so on and so forth. So again, we're in the 2,000, between 2,000 and 3,000 grams mark. Now, before I move away from Royal Armoury's examples, I'm just going to show one example which doesn't have an axe blade. So this example has a hammer and a beak, as they're called. Um, Bec de Corbin is the long spike on the back. So by nature, these tend to be lighter. So the type with axe blades tend to be heavier. The type with a hammer and a and a beak tend to be lighter. And again, that does make a difference to techniques. I should reiterate that many of the treatises we look at don't show pole axes with an axe blade. They show pole axes, they're still called pole axes, but they show them with a hammer and a beak. And that does make the weapon lighter. It makes it lighter, it makes it more maneuverable, makes it more balanced towards the middle, it makes it quicker. Um, so it does make a difference to the techniques, absolutely. And of course, you don't have an axe blade anymore. Um, so axe blades are useful for trapping and hooking, particularly, although you can do a lot of those things with the beak as well. And of course, for chopping, and you can't do that with this type of uh, pole axe. So it is a different version of pole axe, and these tend to be lighter, and indeed, this example is lighter at 1,780 grams, which for the Imperial amongst you is three pounds and 14 ounces. So that's quite significantly lighter, isn't it? So it's, it's just under, you know, it's just under four pounds. So it's quite heavy compared to a sword, uh, but for a pole arm, not heavy at all. Okay, this is really quite a light weapon, despite the fact it's got a hammer on it and a spike. So there we go, 1,780 grams. Now we're gonna look at three examples from the Wallace collection. First of all, we're gonna start off with the much loved and much reproduced, it has to be said, um, a so-called Gothic, probably French, um, pole which uh, has its langets, it has a circular disc guard, it's got everything on it. So not to say that obviously I don't think the shaft is original, um, but it has got everything on it that would contribute towards its weight or mass. Uh, and in this case, this very famous pole axe, which is not dissimilar to my replica actually, is 2.495 kilograms. So basically exactly the same as, as my particular replica. So my replica very close to this, 
and the same weight. We're talking about two and a half kilograms here. Now this example is a 16th century example dated to about 1530 um, and this has a crescent typed blade a bit like the other 16th century one we saw, a crescent shaped blade and a hammer on the back and an interesting flared reinforced spike on the top. It doesn't have a top spike and the shaft is almost certainly not original but uh, nevertheless the total mass is 2.33 kilograms so 2330 grams um, again in exactly the same ballpark now this final example from the Wallace collection is an interesting one. Um, I've actually held this, in fact I've held two of the Wallace collection poleaxes myself and you can, if you search on my channel for polax, you can see uh, a video of myself and Toby Capwell, Dr. Tobias Capwell at the Wallace collection looking at poleaxes um, and we've handled these and they're, they're very very nice and um, very interesting weapons. This particular example is earlier and has a different constructional method to a lot of the later 15th century poleaxes. This is dated um, by the Wallace Collection to 1430. I think it could be later than that. Um, in fact, this type of polax appears in art over quite a broad period, but absolutely it could be an earlier example. Interesting to note, this is earlier but has the crescent-shaped axe blade. So just to highlight, crescent-shaped axe blades that we've seen on the 16th century examples, they're not always a 16th century thing, you do find crescent-shaped axe blades absolutely um, on f even 14th century poleaxes and certainly on 15th century poleaxes as well, they're not always straight-edged axe blades. Um, but this example has a crescent-shaped axe blade balanced by quite a thick, uh, heavy hammer on the back. Now the important thing when it comes to mass or weight about this poleaxe to note is that the shaft is fully encased in langets. The langets are fully encasing, they're not just in strips in the wood, they go all the way around the wood for quite a way down from the uh, from the head. Now the mass of this you'll be wondering, I've been, uh, I've been implying here it's going to be heavier and indeed it is heavier, it is 2.95 kilograms, so 2950 grams. So it's still in that 2,000 to 3,000 uh, kind of um, parameter that we find pretty much all of these poleaxes fitting into. An interesting, again, when I'm, we're talking about parameters, it's an interesting thing to note that if something is not genuine, if something's a replica, sometimes it might fall outside of those parameters. Not always. You could have a very good replica. Um, but if something were a Victorian fake, it might be very well made to look at, but it might be too heavy in the hands. And we often find this with fake Victorian medieval swords, medieval style swords made in the Victorian era. They feel crap in the hand and they're too heavy. So uh, a non-genuine poleaxe you might find is well outside of these parameters for some reason. So anyway, this example, heavier than usual, slightly different design to many of the other ones we're looking at here. In fact, it's pretty much unique survival as far as I know, although you find comparable examples in art. Well, I don't know of any others surviving that look like this. So 2.95 kilograms. It's a beefy one, but I've got to say in the hand, it still feels very nice. Now let's move over to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which has some absolutely fantastic medieval and renaissance um, items of arms and armour. And this example of a Polax, uh, looking not dissimilar to examples in the Royal Armouries in the Wallace Collection, um, is dated to circa 1480, is probably French, um, could conceivably be English, but anyway, it's Northwest European. And um, it's complete, so this has its langets, it has its shaft, again the shaft, probably not original, but it, it simulates the weight of, a, of the original shaft. Um, and uh, But the most important aspect here is it does have complete full langets and has all of the elements on it, except maybe for the tail spike, which is always a bit of an unknown, uh, but more or less all of the elements that we would expect to find on the complete original item when it was made. And it weighs. Uh, 2,948.4 grams. So, um, 2.95 grams, so very similar in fact to examples in the Royal Armouries and the Wallace Collection and it is at the very much at the heavier end of the scale but it's still within that 2,000 to 3,000 gram parameters um, and uh, it, a, a beautiful and iconic polax. This example also in the Met is dated a little bit earlier to circa 1480, I'm, uh, sorry 1470. I'm not sure exactly why they date this 10 years earlier than the previous example. I'd say they could be both made at exactly the same time as far as I can tell but maybe they have some specific reason for that. Uh, maybe they found an example in uh, an artwork that dates to 1470 uh, that looks like like this, I don't know. Um, but again, a bit like one of those Royal Armouries examples, this has got the beak sticking out
out of the hammer. Really cool combination. So you get kind of the best of both worlds, kind of not. Uh, but anyway, it looks super cool. Uh, and this is also important in that it seems to have pretty much all of its elements again. It's got the full langets, it's got a shaft. Probably not the, um, almost certainly not the original shaft. I would say it has clearly got a little bit of the outer langets that come from the top spike uh, broken off. So it has lost a little bit of mass, certainly this. Definitely it's lost a little bit of mass, but we don't know how much. Um, and this one weighs 2,976.7 grams, so uh, 2.98 kilograms. So again, it's at the top end of the weight scale here. It's just under 3,000 um, grams, or three kilograms. For the Imperial amongst you, that is six pounds, nine ounces. Um, so this, is, again, it's sub seven pounds, okay? So under seven pounds, under three kilograms, but close up there. So it does seem that when you see a pole axe in art, for example, if it has very extensive langets or very ornamented langets, you can make an educated guess based on the surviving examples that the mass is gonna be about three kilograms or slightly under. Now this example also from the Met is dated by them to circa 1475. Now you'll notice it has a crescent shaped ax blade on it balanced by a hammer and a top um, spike dag that's shaped kind of like a spearhead or pike head. Now uh, a lot of people identified this particular style of pole axe with Venice so oftentimes when you find a 15th century uh, pole axe that has a crescent shaped blade it will be described as Venetian. That's because some survive in Venice in collections there uh, and artwork associated with Venice. That being said you do also find crescent shaped axe blades from not from Venice. Um, so what the attribution for this, I'm not actually sure. I don't know if it's definitely Venetian, but there's a good chance it could be Italian. Um, but nevertheless, it's got a crescent-shaped axe blade, so it looks a little bit different to, say, the French and English type, of, which often have a straight axe blade on them, although they also sometimes have curved um, blades on theirs as well, from the artwork we know. Um, but this is dated to circa 1475 by them. I would say it could be later than that. It could be up to 1500, could even be over uh, past 1500. But nevertheless, they dated it 1475. And the weight, which is what you all want to know, is 2920 grams, so 2.92 kilograms. So again, we're very close to three kilograms, but we're sub three kilograms. Uh, Imperial, six pounds, seven ounces. Uh, so again, we're under, well under seven pounds. Um, it's about six and a half pounds. So six and a half pounds, just under three kilograms. This is the kind of mass that we're looking at. Even though the design of this one is completely different to the previous two we've seen, still in the same weight category. And the final example I'm going to give, also from the Met, uh, this is a Polax that they date to circa 1450. I would say it could be anywhere between 1450 and probably about 1480, but nevertheless, um, we're looking at the middle of the 15th century to the latter part of the 15th century. Um, and it's of a, a type which is almost certainly French or Northwest European, could be Dutch, could be English. Um, and again, we've got the beak sticking out of the hammer. It's quite a characteristic type and I think very cool looking type. And um, this is a little bit, you'll notice it looks a bit leaner. It's not, it's not particularly fancy. It's not got uh, lots of decoration on it. The langets are relatively slender. And indeed, this is reflected in the weight. The weight is 2466 grams, 2,466 grams or 2.47 uh, kilograms and in imperial that is five pounds seven ounces so this is sub six pounds in fact it's about five and a half pounds and about two and a half kilograms so this is notably lighter that being said there's always the great unknown did this originally have um, elements on the shaft such as guard and remember the guards the discards you can have one or two of them and it makes quite a difference to the mass Equally a tail spike, it could have a very minimal tail spike, it could have no tail spike, or it could have a really substantial tail spike, and that equally will change the total mass and the balance. So I hope this has been useful and illuminating. Essentially, um, to summarize, we've seen that pole axes can come in roughly four different uh, varieties of length, about head height, above head height, about chest height, or all the way down kind of like hip height, okay? There are roughly, you can split them all into those four length categories. 
The most common ones shown in art seem to be about head height or a bit above head height or a bit below head height. Okay, so roughly kind of from here to here um, in, in height is kind of where most pole axes in art are shown. In terms of weight, as we've seen, if it's an axe bladed type, it tends to be quite a bit heavier than the hammer headed type. So if you've got hammer and a beak, that's generally lighter, although I only showed one example here. I have looked at others and they are almost always lighter, quite notably lighter, like about a pound lighter. Okay, so if you've got a hammer and a beak, that tends to be lighter. It will therefore balance closer to the middle of the shaft and will be a quicker, more nimbler weapon. If you have an ax blade, obviously that gives you other options. Uh, but if you have an ax blade balanced by either a spike or a hammer, that is usually around two and a half kilograms. Sometimes it can be below two and a half kilograms and quite often it can be all the way up to nearly three kilograms. But none of the examples I've looked at have been over three kilograms. All of them have been sub three kilograms. I hope that's been interesting and useful. Um, this has been in fact, I've enjoyed it. Uh, this is something I've never done before and I'm really useful for, uh, really grateful to have this data to hand now because I'm sure it'll be useful in lots of future discussions. So thanks a lot for watching. If you're not subscribed, please do so and come back again for my next video, which I hope will be as equally riveting as this one was. I'm Matt Easton. I will continue to be and I'll see you back here soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.